Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is uh, December 15th, 2022, and we are excited for another treat, another John Larson episode. We are joined in studio by literally your favorite woman podcast co-host of Mormon Stories in 2022. It's official, Kara Burrell. Wow. I mean, you and Mark, you're like neck and neck, but we actually did a brief I'm just poll. grateful to be nominated. <laughs> We're all winners. Nuance Ho, Kara Burrell, thanks hey, for everyone. joining us today. Thanks for having me. I love these John Larson episodes. How are you feeling about uh, holidays and Christmas time coming up and Thanksgiving behind us? I'm just ready to blast through it and get to spring. And my 14th <laughs> wedding anniversary is in three days. So that's when oh, I get it. That's when I get to escape from all of the shit and actually go like be and have a a night away from my family and I'm going to go stand at the grand America and stuff. So that's all I care about right now. Fun weekend away. I know why you like spring, but I'm not telling. Um, <laughs> things go into bloom. <laughs> introvertness Person and extrovertness. Personal all. joke. Okay. And we are super excited. It's because I said shit within the first 10 minutes, isn't it? <laughs> well, uh, you know, whenever we have Kara and John Larson on, you just need to know there might be some swear words. But we're all adults, and hopefully we can handle it. John Larson's in the house. Brother John, how are you, brother? Good. Thanks for having me. Hi, John. Yeah. Good you. to uh, talk to you both. Hi, Kara. Hi, bud. All right. Well, for those, who, for those who don't know, John Larson has, uh, he has a history of being one of the most famous and beloved uh, podcasters in Mormonism. He was the host of Mormon Expression Podcast for many years. You can find the catalog of Mormon Expression Podcast on Spotify, on iTunes. Um, and uh, we were really grateful that John was willing to come and uh, do a monthly series on Mormon Stories Podcast. And if you go to mormonstories.org slash Mormon Expression, you will uh, learn a bit more about that uh, situation. And you can donate um, if you want to keep uh, John Larson and Kara um, on the show. And uh, we appreciate everyone who financially supports uh, these episodes, John Larson, they're loved. So, um, so yeah. So John Larson, what you got for us uh, this week? Well, you know, we've had a, a great year. Um, I, I think this is episode 18 or 19 that we've done since you uh, graciously invited me back. And it's been a wild ride this year. It's a, it's, it's been a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of heavy, heady stuff. You know, yeah, you feel it. It is. It it's heavy, um, but it's also there's this. You've got this fan base, John Larson, and you too, Kara, of just people that they want it. They want the passion. They want the intellect. They want the humor, and uh, they want the intensity. So, as long as you're, you both are doing okay. You know, depression, anxiety, mental health wise. <laughs> uh, this time of year, we all go around the room and say which John Larson episodes we're thankful for. Okay. The Willie and Martin Hancock Company. I am grateful for that one. That was a big one. I think the Great Salt Lake one. I'm I'm super grateful for yeah, the one on the, great, on the Great Salt Lake. How about you, John? Do you have a favorite for the year? Oh man, do I have a favorite for the year? Um, I try to immediately forget about them after <laughs> I record them. So it's this one. This one is my favorite one for the year. That's. I didn't know. I didn't know you were officially a Buddhist, John Larson. But that's uh, that's very mm. Buddhist of you. Um, yeah, I've never found anything wrong with uh, Buddhism, at least the uh, original teachings. Of course, it's subject to human foibles, but yeah, I'll, I'll take it. I'm a Buddhist. All right. And we'll, we'll, we'll invite our audience. We have a live viewing audience. We want to ask everyone who is joining us on YouTube to please subscribe. We're trying to hit 100,000 subscribers on YouTube uh, within the next couple months because good things happen when you hit that mark. And... Um, if you subscribe, uh, not only will it help with the algorithms, but also you'll be notified when new episodes come up. So for all those reasons, please subscribe. Uh, a big thanks to Colby Reddish. Colby, we love you. Colby's love already you, Colby. sending in a super, super chat. For those of you who want to support John or Kara financially, um, you can also do it through the super chat feature on YouTube. So we appreciate all that, but please, please, please do subscribe. Whether you're listening to the, viewing the live stream now or, you know, viewing it after uh, the live stream, please become a subscriber. All right. Um, and, and of course, our, our, uh, those in the chat, both on Facebook and on YouTube, 
We would love to see your comments today. We'll try and integrate them as we can. Maven is here moderating the chats. We appreciate Maven uh, being here in studio. Um, and, uh, and yeah, let's have, let's have another great episode. So John Larson, any, um, any announcements you want to make before we jump in? Um, no, no, I don't, I don't think I have any announcements, but I'd like to echo you and, um, and, um, thank Maven. I mean, she works behind the scene tirelessly, tirelessly. I know I'm not always the prompt, the most prompt person in getting my notes or getting the, the, the titles and all that kind of stuff out. And, um, you know, she's always gracious and help. John froze for a second, but I'm, I'm, he's basically singing Maven's praises. So, uh. Kara, I'm guessing I'm guessing you're jumping in on the support for that. I absolutely am. If I were him, I would be saying, Maven, you're amazing. Yeah. Thanks for keeping this this truck moving. So Kara, we uh we're on a live stream and John Larson froze. Okay, he's back. Yeah, John I'm Larson. back. Uh, uh, you got my love for Maven, right? That that's that's all I was saying. Yeah, we, we picked it up for you. All right. Yeah, sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, I'll have to say I you know, I I work in, in uh partially remote and I'm on um, video calls um, all day, every day. And I have to apologize. Comcast has not been reliable the last week or so. So we might drop, but I'll try to just pick up where I, I left off. Well, that's where Kara and I can be professionals and we have to be Johnny on the spot or Susie on the spot with the comedy and the fill-ins. I know mm -hmm. Kara can do it. Uh, it's hard to keep up with Kara basically. Johnny and Susie. It's more like Chad and Becky, isn't it? I know. <laughs> all right, John. So yeah, we love Maven. What else you got for us? All right. Well, let's let's jump. You know, it's funny you were talking about um, the, the the mental health of this. I've, I've said before that um, oftentimes when I do these things, I, I made a decision a long time ago just to not check my emotions because this whole thing, um, processing religion and, and all that is very emotional, um, emotional driven thing. And um, that was a, a decision I made for good or for bad. I, I don't operate the way I operate here in all my life. I, I try to be more of a nuanced hoe myself. Um, but um, th th there is, I, I, I believe in what we're doing. I believe what we're saying, but it, it is a negative energy. Uh, and, and I think the world needs less negative energy. And, but this is uh, ultimately a positive thing. And I was thinking about this leading up to this uh, discussion, and I, I was realizing that when I did this before, when I did Mormon Expression, I always balanced it with um, basically community activism. That you know, I, I I came on the podcast, but but I was always like hosting things and trying to encourage people and and to do that positive thing. And now that I I live out here in the sticks, I don't I don't really have as much opportunity for that. And that does kind of. Um, you know, weigh on me a little bit. Uh, I, I don't like all the negative energy is what I'm saying. Um, so, you know, I thought for, for this episode and, and a few more, I wanted to, I wanted to touch base again. I want to touch the roots of where I got, um, how I got here and some of the information that I used when I was processing out of the church. Um, so that's kind of, a. That's kind of where, where we're going to go tonight. And I do have to apologize. You asked me if I had any business. I was supposed to come into Utah earlier um, or a couple of weeks ago, and I ended up um, canceling the trip for various uh, personal reasons and other things. And, you know, I in these days, it's kind of hard to justify getting on a plane unless something's going on. But I will give a preview sort of I'm probably letting the cat out of the bag. Um, I am planning on a, um, appearing at Thrive um, in Seattle in March. So if you're going to be in Seattle um, in, in March, uh, you can come see me. And whenever I talk at Thrive conferences, I don't criticize the church. It's, it's all usually about trying to find your sense of spirituality when you don't believe in anything. That's usually what I talk about. I didn't even know there was a Thrive in Seattle in March. Uh, now I need to, maybe I need to plan a trip. But if yeah. you tell people you're not going to criticize the church, you may have less people come. Oh, come oh well, no, no, let's, John. <laughs> I don't, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll still call a spade a spade. Okay. All right. All right. Well, that's exciting to hear about Thrive, Thrive Seattle. Yeah. No, there'll be more information. It's just po preliminary, but um, I, I've agreed to go up there. I'm looking forward to it. It's a, it's a great city. Uh, the the ex-Mormons and Mormons who I've had the pleasure of interacting with from the area over the years have been fantastic people. Um, it'll be a lot of fun. All right. 
All right. So I guess the topic today is is primary sources in Mormon history, right? Yeah. Well, let, let me let me give a little background. Um, when I was uh, a believing Mormon, I was taught, like probably all the rest of you were, to not um, believe um, any exterior sources, especially ones that were critical of the church. They were uh, misguided and lies at best and demonically inspired at worst. Um, that there was a great Luciferian uh, conspiracy against us pure and righteous Mormons, and they were there to um, deceive us. Well, um, in, you know, I, like everyone else, had the formidable shelf that I put things on when I'd run into things that didn't make sense or, 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 or whatever. And my shelf really started breaking in around about 2003, 2002. Um, and the last time I went to church was 2005, so that there were a couple years there. So I decided I want to get to the bottom of church history. I kind of want to really understand what was going on. And a big motivator for me was polygamy. I really wanted to understand what polygamy was about. You know, I'd, I'd heard lots of things, but, you know, uh, growing up as a multi-generational Mormon, I knew the family tales of polygamy, and none of them were really positive at all. Um, so I'll kind of say, well, let's cut through the crap. So, so I decided in the beginning that I, I had seen enough problems, um, in my, you know, 30 years in the church with official church sources that even as a full believer, I knew that they couldn't always be believed. I knew that they always put spin on things or covered things up or things that, that I knew about that they would gloss over. So I decided that what I wanted to do is I wanted to only read source documents and that started a really a, a passionate love that i still have today for for church history and you know i get on these podcasts and we're you know we're, we're punching hard at the church and pointing out different problems and 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 you know all with the 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 hope and intent of helping people but i think sometimes it, it buries or glosses over just the the fascinating part about the church. I, I, I've, I've said before the church has three F's. It is, it is fascinating, it's infuriating, and it's funny. That's my three three F's. Whoa, um, I, thought, I thought you were going to go somewhere else with the F's, John Larson. You, you, see what I did there? You see pulled, what I did there? You pulled the pastor on us. That was good. So, so <laughs> um, the fascinating and, um, and uh, funny part is um, it, it sometimes gets gets neglected over the the infuriating part of the of the church. Um, so so um, I also know that we live in the age of internet the internet and um, when when I left the church, um, Facebook didn't exist, and um, there were there were great resources out there, but not like there there are now. So a lot of times we had to go find the original um, source documents as best we could. And um, that was a great privilege because it, it, it allowed me to engage church history directly, unfiltered, not by the critics, not by the um, apologists, not by the, the, the leaders in the church. Um, and so for tonight, um, I, I've, I've actually started creating a bunch of these lists that over the next year I want to share with people, um, you know, different aspects of, of Mormonism, you know, like what are the best um, faithful histories of the church? What are the best... Um, histories by people who have um, become disillusioned with the church. But tonight, I want to focus in on the early period, the, basically the Smith period of, of, of the church, and I want to go over 10 um, sources that are readily available. I don't, I don't want anything, uh, I don't want to talk about anything tonight that's too um, archaic, and, the, and, the, and the, the church has a terrible um, history with this. So the church likes to take... Um, um, it's historical documents, and then wrap them up in really expensive packaging. And I'm I'm directly referring to say the 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 um, Joseph Smith papers. So so you know those books are glossy and and they're expensive. A lot of them are over a hundred dollars. They're oversized. It's like they were designed specifically to not be affordable or readable by most people. And, and, you know, the question is, who are they making these things for? You know, like, if, if I want to learn about church history, I want to know what people wrote, and I want to know that it hasn't been messed with. But I'm not really doing, um, like, handwriting analysis to see if, uh, uh, you know, Lucy Smack Mac 
pressed harder on the page than um, W.W. Phelps. So I, I'm not exactly sure who the church is trying to appeal to. I think they're really, uh, if I'm going to accuse them of negative things, I would say they're doing this game to keep this material out of the common people's hand. So for tonight, I picked 10 um, resources that will um, really give you a, a beautiful and accurate view of those first 14, 16 years of the church. And these are all affordable. We put up in the link, um, Amazon links to all of these. And I believe that everything that we're going to talk about tonight is also in the public domain. So if you just go to a Google search, you can find these sources online, but I'm a lover of books. So um, I would encourage people who like books to, to, to go after these and read it yourself. Don't listen to me. Don't listen to Delin. Don't listen to the church. Don't listen to the apologist. Go engage it yourself. And that, that's what this um, list is about tonight. And John, I'll just, uh, you know, and Kara, I, you may have a, a question or reaction here too. Like if I'm thinking about uh, the types of people we want to reach with this podcast, we not only want, um, the, you know, this type of information is not only helpful to people that are suspicious that the church is withholding information or hiding information or misleading people. Going to primary sources is also super useful for faithful Mormons that don't want anti-Mormon or ex-Mormon bias um, kind of, you know, filtering or weighing through the evidence. So, so the good thing is about one of the good things about primary sources is it's good for all sides, um, regardless of where you are. That's the first thing that came to my mind. Um, the second thing is I'm just thinking about like what it was like to try and learn about the church, you know, 30 or 40 years ago when I would have wanted to start learning. It's kind of like you had Joseph, you know, maybe a history by Joseph Fielding Smith, that would have been super curated and filtered. If you were really lucky, you would have had something by B.H. Roberts that would have been like a, like a, you know, a consolidated history of the church in some way. Um, and then you would have had the Journal of Discourses, of course, if you, you know, knew someone who had like that 18 volume set or whatever that was. But there wasn't an internet and you didn't know about any other books. The only book you would have known about maybe would have been um, No Man Knows My History by Fawn Brody. And of course, you would have been warned that that's evil and anti-Mormon and you're not supposed to read it. And of course, the Tanner stuff would have been all off limits. So that's kind of, if I'm thinking back to what I would have done to try and learn church history, and then of course, you would have had the seminary and institute manuals um, made available, the One Church History and the Fullness of Times manual that was around for a while. Um, and then the only other thing I'll say is, John Larson, do you remember when those CDs or DVD um, ROMs came out where I think it was signature books. You know, this is kind of pre-internet, put a bunch of, of these original documents on DVD. Do you remember any of that or is that before your time? Yeah, signature books did one. And then I actually had it in, in my notes there. This was um, b way before the Joseph Smith papers. Um, but, you know, some of these papers would, 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 get, would get leaked. Um, um, and, and maybe there's a, a brief history of, of kind of the history of church history we need to talk about. Um, Leonard Arrington was the church historian for a lot of years during the what, what Mormon um, scholars call the Camelot period. And during that period, we're talking about the 60s and 70s, um, he was the church historian and um, he allowed graduate students to um, come in and into the church archives, and they were able to see a lot of material that got shut out during the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. There's about 30 years that we had to take these scholars' word for it. And if we were to go through a, a list of, of, of Mormon scholars who, it, who wrote these books, who were Leonard Arrington's grad students, it's a list of who's who in things that, things that you've read and had access to. So, people, but, like, uh, people like Michael Quinn, and uh, uh, Marquardt, um, um, Marquardt, and uh, people. Um, like, yeah, um, the the guys who write about Joseph Smith. Uh, anyway, you've had uh, most of them Richard who are still Tur Richard Turley. Right? Yeah, Probably you've with... had a lot of these guys on 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 your uh, oh, yeah. on your podcast. A lot of great scholars, and and we'll go through over the course of this next year um, because books, Mormon history, books are are my passion, and and I, I want to share that with people. And oh, by the way, I, I want to say, you know, you were saying there are all these reasons to 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 read this stuff, and I want to add because it's fun when you when you start reading Joseph Smith the way he. Acts, you realize that there's this there's a guy that the church talks about and then there's this whole other guy over there who's this really fascinating person who you have not even met most of you 
and even the critics, you know, where they they go and pull the worst things he said, but you're still not getting a flavor for who that guy was. And so so it's it's really interesting. Anyway, to to your point, it was in the 90s that some of these documents had been leaked. So the church put together this CD. They said they were going to they were going to put um they were going to put documents out. And they, they, honest to God, they redacted some of these documents with big black bars, you know, like, like you were reading something from, I don't know, like a, a FBI, know. like an FBI. Right. And these are, these are documents that are 170 years old. And the church said, well, we want to protect people's privacy. And it's kind of like, oh, bullshit. Like you guys drag people's name through the mud all the time. And the idea that, that all these years later, but they also, um, um, priced it so high and they did a limited run they've done this many many times they i think they only printed like 500 of them and they were 300 dollars each just like 30 years ago those are the kind of games that the church has been playing even as they slow roll these joseph smith papers it's been so long they could have released all of it uh, um without a problem but they're you know they're they're because because if they're doing what they're saying they're saying all right we're just going to show you what we got well that's easy you don't have to have editorial um nonsense on it uh that's neither here nor there, I guess. Yeah. It's been super, just incidentally, it's been super fun for me to read Sandra Tanner's biography because it talks about how Joseph Fielding Smith ruled the church history department with an iron fist for decades and decades and restricted access to pretty much everything. Even apostles couldn't get certain diaries and journals and, uh, of course, you know, cut accounts of the first vision out of, you know, a Joseph Smith diary if he needed to. And um, it was just a really dark, dark time. And and John, wouldn't you say that he, even if it's B.H. Roberts' history of the church or Joseph Fielding Smith's history of the church that tried to consolidate an overview of church history, that those historical books were were found very much wanting? Well, they are, and and I, I plan on going through all those histories of the church um, as they've been rewritten. Um, the problem is they always were infused with the current interpretation of the doctrine, but Mormon doctrine has been so slippery that that itself has become an embarrassment to the church because you have them constantly correcting the history, but then they have to correct the corrections and correct the corrections and correct the corrections. And, and, um, and then we have just, um, a, a, a lot of nothing, you know? Um, so, uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, uh, so wh where's next? Where do we go next? All right. Well, let, let's let's jump in. Um, number one, an American prophet's record: the diaries and journals of Joseph Smith. I, I've kind of organized these um, sequentially. Um, I, I think it's uh, ten bucks. Um, it's still available on Amazon, um, and it, so this book was um, compiled by Scott H. Farling, who unfortunately um, passed away in 2018. Um, he was a BYU professor. Um, all of the, the the guys who edited these books, they are they are, and we'll go through this. They are all faithful LDS. We don't have anything in this list by anybody who um, who left the church, except David Whitmer, and we'll get there. Um, but the American Prophets record, the diaries and journals of Joseph Smith, and um, it is a a book that that, that shows the the exact text, and and they do do um corrections so that you can actually read it because a lot of the words are misspelled or they're left off you know they're they're they're, they're notes they're just from a, um, a regular person so but they they have a marking system so you can see exactly what was written and if you don't believe this book um you can then go to the joseph smith papers because i think all of these have been released in the joseph smith papers where you can actually see the photographs of the handwriting if you want to um this book opened up my big first mormon existential crisis um because um joseph smith is considered by mormons to be the greatest mortal who ever existed second only to jesus christ who is a god right so but for, for Mormons, Joseph Smith is the intellectual, philosophical Superman of all of human existence, um, which is what I've been taught. And, and in case I thought somebody might say no, I have printed out the lyrics um, to the song in the hymn book, Praise to the Man. Shall we read them? <laughs> sure. 
<laughs> Praise to the man, which is Joseph Smith, by the way, and, uh, who communes with Jehovah. Jesus anointed the prophet and seer. Blessed to open the last dispensation, kings shall extol him and nations revere. Hail to the prophet, ascended to heaven. Traitors and tyrants, such as John DeLynn, now fight him in vain. Mingling with gods, he can plan for his brethren. Death cannot conquer the hero again. Um, praise to his memory, he died as a martyr. Honored and blessed be his ever great name. Long shall his blood, which was shed by assassins, plead unto heaven while the earth lauds his fame. I'll skip the chorus. Great is his glory and endless his priesthood. Ever and ever his keys he will hold. Faithful and true he will enter his kingdom, crowned in the midst of the prophets of old. Let's see. Sacrifice brings forth the blessings of heaven. Earth must atone for the death, the blood of that man. I can only sing it if I pretend I'm punching him in the face. I'm sorry. I have to Wake up the world for the conflict of justice. Millions shall know Brother Joseph again. And it should be noted that for many decades in the temple, um, the the patrons in the temple swore vengeance on the on the world um, for even, Joseph Smith. Even that hymn used to say, "Long, long will his blood, which was shed by assassins, stain Illinois while the earth lauds his fame." It used Indeed. to say, stain Illinois, and then they changed it to plead unto heaven. Right? Am I right? Do I got that right? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, but I, I just this this the 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 it's hard to explain. And 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 John, we've been I don't know if you've you've released this information to the public, but I'll 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 leak it. Uh you guys did some research and, and found that half of Mormon stories listeners are are not Mormons or never were. That's right. They 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 just find this interesting. So I, I realize sometimes I have to explain explain things. It's hard to understand just how important uh, Mormons believe Joseph Smith is. I, I, I've said nothing here that's hyperbole at all. I made a shirt in high school for a Joseph Smith stake young men, young women's art competition where we had to show our testimony of Joseph Smith through art. So some people did dances and I made a graphic t-shirt in, in the shape of a heart with all of my favorite images of Joseph Smith. So that was a stake activity that everyone had to participate in. Yeah, if you example ask... Example A. If you ask Mormons if they worship Joseph Smith, they're going to say, no, we worship God and Jesus. But then they sing that hymn and talk about him often more than they talk about Jesus. And you're not allowed to ever criticize him or say anything bad about him. So if And then they erect statues towards him. If, if erecting statues towards him, singing hymns to him, and uh, not allowing any criticism of him isn't worshiping, I guess I don't know what worshiping is. Indeed. So, but I set this up as this first dilemma, and I, I, I'm, this is this is part of my story. I was a faithful Latter Day Saint reading this book and the next one we're going to talk about, and I was just engaged by who this man really was. I, and I, I don't mean that like that he was a, a just a, a villain and a criminal, but he was a human being um, with with um, parts and passions, as they say. And, and um, this existential dilemma was, how is it that we revere this man so greatly? And he wrote lots of stuff, and we don't even bother to read it. How is it that when you learn Mormon history, you are not pouring over everything that he said? Muslims try to get every last word that came out of Muhammad's mouth. Buddhists try to find everything that the Buddha said. And we could go on and on and on. Why do Mormons love a man so much and have such a repulsion to anything that he actually wrote? You can buy the journal of Joseph Smith online for 10 bucks. But I doubt if there's more than 1% of the audience listening right now who has read this book. Okay, so John, I'm going to put this up on the screen for those who have a visual sense, is this is uh this is the book that you're talking about, right, John? Is that the book? Yep, that's it. All right, yeah, I've seen this book in many many a Mormon home, um, and and we'll include a link to it in the show notes as well. 
Okay, so that that that's it. And and again, I'm not I'm not a big fan of Jeff Bezos. Um, all of your favorite, uh, if you're in Salt Lake City or in Utah, all of your favorite retailers, like I don't I don't want to start naming them because then I'll forget them. They all have copies of these books. Um, you can you can go to any bookstore and ask them to order them for you. They're still you know basically in print. So for sure, we're fans of Benchmark Books here on Mormon Stories and of Ken Sanders Rare Books. So I'm I'm happy to give shout outs to them. Benchmark Ken Sanders, Coford. There, um, you know, there's there's a lot of these guys. Yeah. Um, and, and any book retailer in, in Utah will be happy to get it for you. Okay. So, so, I mean, to, to me that, that, that's like a, a roundhouse to the, to the face. Like, honestly, why are we not studying Joseph Smith? And that was a huge crack in my, in my, in my testimony, because it, it was clear that we were avoiding the topic. Like if, if we, cause we would go to three hours of church at the time and we would have Sunday school. Why were we just reviewing the same things every four years and not actually reading all this stuff that Prophet Sears and Revelators had actually written? Well, I'll invite you to read the book and, and um, you can uh, decide for yourself. Really quickly, John, w reading this book, do you, you probably read it a long time ago. Like what we, we all know that Joseph Smith wasn't the best writer. Uh, we all know that he got scribes, um, you know, because he couldn't really write well. Um, so what's it like? Do you remember what it was like reading his diaries? Was it a fun read? Was it an interesting read? Was it tedious? Or do you oh, even remember? I, I, th I thought it was fun. I was going to go through and and pull all the all the the the, the G whiz moments out of, out of these books. They're they're in there. But um, yeah, he, you know he 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 speaks and he writes like a regular frontier person. You know, um, and 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 there's nothing really that, that sticks out in my memory that was in this one other than. His humanity, it, it, it took him out of the clouds for me. That wasn't enough to make me leave the church, by the way. But but it, 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 it was to, to, and all of these books, that these are real human beings that were really in on the frontier trying to, you know, work out this new religion and what it meant. And to witness their, their thought process, what they believed at the time, what they didn't, um, um, it's just, it's just a, uh, uh, I, 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 it's just a joy of feeling the connection to him for me. Yeah. All right. What do you think Kara has, uh, has, has John convinced you to go out and get this book and read from the man himself? Yeah. Can't wait to hear his, uh, backwoods folksy talk, <laughs> but it just reminds me that so many, uh, apostles and leaders don't keep journals anymore. And yeah. I mean, I guess nobody is really like hot off the presses trying to, get Joseph Smith's journal either, but I do love your point, John Larson. And it reminds me of uh, one of the very first episodes that you did about the curse of Cain and making the point that like you have a prophet on earth. They only have so many revelations to give so many things that they writ wrote down. Are we going to follow them? Or are we going to read them? Are we going to be absorbing these things? If we really believe this person's a prophet and the answer in Mormonism is usually no, we're just going to cherry pick the things that are the most faith promoting, whether it's the doctrines we follow or just, yeah, reading the, the words of a prophet. Yeah. Well, and, and and that's all absolutely true, Kara. Uh, but also, they keep retelling the story um, uh, of, of the foundation of the church to validate whatever it is they're saying right now. You know, you 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 watch like the the some of the videos, the historic videos that were produced during the Hinckley administration, and they're all wearing their you know their Sunday best, and um, they all you know they're I think there's one I remember where they're taking the sacrament, and they're all just just very solemn and um you know in the in the in reality they were they had a loaf of bread and a bottle of wine that they were passing around you know so they were they were they were taking hits off the off the, off the bottle which which to, you know to me there's nothing irreligious about that in 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 a way it's more um special it's more here's this group of people sitting in in the in the living room sharing this communal experience to me that's closer to what the biblical experience was yet these guys in salt lake want it to completely validate who they are so it's 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 the absolute narcissism of of the current 15 that they always have to retell joseph smith as a validation of their perspective got it love that yeah Okay, the second one is sort of a companion to that one. It's the Essential Joseph Smith. Um, this book was um, compiled by Marvin Hill, who was a BYU professor of history, and he passed away in 2016. Um, he is the brother of Donna Hill, who wrote, I think, one of the better um, biographies of Joseph Smith. And um, Marvin Hill also co-wrote Carthage Conspiracy with Dallin Oaks. I just, I'm just anticipating that people will dismiss these books and say, oh, that's just 
anti-Mormon drivel. This was written by, you know, this was collated um, by, you know, somebody who was faithful enough to co-write a book with them, um, Dallin Oaks. Um, uh, what the essential Joseph Smith, I think one of the things you really see here is the, that frontier language mixed with the biblical King James um, English, you know, you're talking about what stands out and this happens in these other books as they, as they, they try to sound, um, um, really spiritual. Um, and, and so the, the model they have is the Bible. So they're always trying to use like Bible phrases and it's just awkward and weird and hilarious and, and endearing. Um, and so it's just, it's just, um, um, wonderful. Um, the book, like, like, um, like the American Prophets record, it preserves the original language, but will oftentimes define terms and put things in brackets so that it is actually readable. So there's a little bit of commentary in, in there, but you can ignore all the commentary if, if you want and just engage the documents directly. And again, these things are, I think, mostly available in the Joseph Smith papers. If you don't believe this book, you can go to the Joseph Smith papers and see it. Okay, so we've got two, two books about Joseph Smith's own words. Yeah, and and some of them are from um, sermons that were, that were that were written down, but but to to me this is the best out you know outside outside the scripture and the revelations. These two books are the are the best way and easiest way to engage um, Joseph Smith directly and get a sense of of how he was how he was talking to folks. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. All right, number three, and people are going to groan on this. Um, we're talking about the Book of Mormon, um, but um, the Book of Mormon. Um, the earliest text as um, compiled by Royal Skousen. Um, this was released uh, 10 years ago, and um, then there's a paperback version that's out now. So the link we have is to the, the paperback version. Uh, Royal Skousen is a professor of linguistics um, emeritus at BYU, and this was a 20-year project for him. Um, he... He um, is the nephew of Cleon Skousen, and so he's kind of in connected to, to Mormon royalty. Um, the Book of Mormon itself was written over 13 months, basically. Um, it was started in, in 1828, and it was it was finished in um, 1830 when it was um, uh, when it was printed. There is the original manuscript, which was the handwritten um, document that's in the handwriting of you know, people like um, Oliver Cowdery, Lucy Mack Smith, um, Emma Smith, just um, um, Martin Harris, the people who acted as his scribe. And interestingly enough, there are handwriting samples in the original manuscript that we haven't identified yet. We don't know who that person was. Um, there were only two of the manuscripts that existed, and one of them was put in the... Um, in the cornerstone of the Nauvoo Temple, and it was um, several um, decades later they dug it out, and unfortunately, water had seeped in and destroyed it. But then there was also the printer's manuscript, um, um, which we do have copies of. As a matter of fact, in 2017, the Mormon Church bought um, the original printer's manuscript for $35 million. Hmm. $35 million. So if we took all the tithing that has ever been paid by everybody listening to this um, episode, all of our money just went for that one manuscript, which of course the church put on display for us all to see, right? Mm. Um, no, it's locked in some vault somewhere. Um, so um, the Skousen took everything that he could find, the original manuscript, the printer's manuscript, and he compiled them all into the kind of the definitive source of what the original transcript of the Book of Mormon was. And there's, this has been done um, several times. This is by far and away the best one. There's a few problems that, that we encounter when we're trying to engage the original um, Book of Mormon. One, you know, when a printer prints, has a paper that represents two pages, and so, and then it's back and front. So they, they, when you running the printing press, you are doing four pages simultaneously, but the, on the left side will be like page number one. And on the right side will be page number 433. Um, so, so Joseph Smith actually changed, was changing the manuscript oftentimes during the runs. So, so we have some of the, the original editions of the Book of Mormon that are different from copy to copy to copy um, because they would stop the run and then, and then change the text 
and then continue on with the run. And then you have these different pages that have been put into different, um, that would be, uh, you know, this page that had been changed would go over with this copy number 44. The next one would go to copy 127. So it's, it's all a jumbled up mess. Um, but the key changes have been talked about. I think one of the most accessible ways to do it is the work that was done by Lighthouse Ministries um, that went through and detailed, um, for the most part, all 4,000 changes. Mostly they're grammatical. But um, what, what I think is important about this book, and, and you know, Mark Twain was right, it is chloroform in print. I don't expect anybody to make it all the way through it. But um, that's the Book of Mormon that Joseph Smith um, was the most correct book of any that had ever been written. Of course, Joseph Smith was involved in the, 19, the 1837 revision and the 1842 revision, but I think the original one, um, you know, is just to, 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 to engage and see what the book that started this whole movement. And, um, of course, it absolutely comes from a faithful source. Hmm. Sounds like a newspaper editor with like a 4 a.m. deadline who's like, hurry, Joseph, uh, is God one person or two? <laughs> is Mary a virgin or not? And he's like, well, I'm scrumbling and putting the papers together and coming up with the exact revelation of what the exact words should be right before the deadline. <laughs> Never a moment too late. Yeah. Yeah. And and honestly, John, it's real. I love it that you're bringing this up. I'm going to go ahead and just show on the screen really quickly something slightly different than what you're talking about. It's the Joseph Smith Papers kind of original Book of Mormon manuscript that's not only got kind of the handwritten, um, you know, manuscript that the scribes would have written, but then, uh, you know, the computer-generated text that goes next to it. And, you know, one of the most um, one of the most important things that apologists do, or that Mormon general authorities do, is they try and build the Book of Mormon up to be so incredibly amazing that it's the greatest single witness that Joseph was a prophet and that the church is true, because the Book of Mormon is just unassailably brilliant and never could have writ been written by an uneducated farm boy, you know, in his late teens or early twenties. And so, but but that's very different than when you actually go and look at the manuscript, you know, and I've got it here up on the screen, and you look at the actual text that's generated from the original manuscript, and we have to thank, you know, the Joseph Smith Papers Project for producing this. Once you just, once you just, just read and try and read the original manuscript, it takes a lot of the um, wonder and amazement completely away it demystifies and it demotes the quality of the book of mormon just right there in and of itself and then when you take that next step to you know the the skousen version of the book of mormon the original version that, that you're showing us here john you know all you got to do is read that and read how different it is from the book of mormon that we have today and then you just go to the tanners you know gerald and sandra tanner's work and you read about the thousands and the thousands of changes that were made between the original, you know, um, uh, sort of transcription and the book that we have today. That's that's a, all a really important process you go through to help demystify and um, you know relegate the Book of Mormon to the place that it belongs, which is 19th century fan fiction written on the frontier by a dude who knew a lot about the Bible, but couldn't really write folk spoke in a folksy accent and, um, and, and used his creative knowledge of, of, you know, things like the mound builder myth and his knowledge of the old Testament and his own personal narratives. And a lot of the Protestant sermons that uh, he would have been exposed to at the time. And he munged that all together into a book that really comes into sharper focus when you start to engage the original manuscripts in the original text. Now, Kara, you're nodding. So I think you I like, like that, that imagery of the sharper focus, because that is when you read these original texts and you actually become a steward of, you know, this Mormon history, like hopefully you viewers are out there wherever you lie on the Mormon or ex Mormon spectrum, you do get a sharper focus of the book of Mormon and, 
from the time I was a youth, everything in the church, let's let's remember back to the Why Ex-Mormons Are So Angry episode, everything was around this idea that Joseph Smith couldn't have written the Book of Mormon. He was just this humble farm boy and that the text that you're reading from in seminary, that this is such beautiful language. It just, it fits so well with the Bible. Everything that you're told is just a very well-constructed lie that is just blurry enough for you to gain that elevated emotion and, and kind of force yourself into a conversion, a communal conversion with your youth groups and your seminaries and you, you go off on a mission because you're then becoming the preacher and the salesman of that elevated emotion. But it was all based on fucking lies. Whoa. Whoa, Kara. Oh, we didn't get angry enough. I just thought I would get there. <laughs> well, and, you know, you know, they, they've, they've done things that um to the book, like, um, if you ever read, and this isn't just Mormons, if you ever have the chance to read the Psalms again, read them written in poetic form. You'll find them much more beautiful and much more engaging, and you won't be distracted by all the verses. Um, so the Bible was organized the way it is to be able to pull exegesis, to be able to talk about you know different passages. But the way it's organized is really difficult to read and breaking it up into chapters like they do and breaking it up into verses. So the original Book of Mormon, um, what didn't look that way, that was uh, Orson Pratt who went and put it into verses. And then it was uh, Bruce R. McConkie who went and wrote the headings. Um, I think Orson Pratt wrote the original headings then he then Bruce R. rewrote them, if I remember correctly. Um, but that's like the teacher's edition telling you what it's supposed to say down here whether or not it actually um, clearly makes that point. But when you when you engage the original Book of Mormon without the um, formatting, you don't naturally go into a bias saying this is scripture. It's a book, and it's a sloppy book. It's sloppy in every way that you can call sloppy. Characters show up after they're dead in the original one. Um, people are where they're not supposed to be. Timelines get mixed up. Um, you know, it's just, as well as all the things we pointed out that are just, uh, just full of... Um, um, you know, things that can't possibly be true or, or, you know, and, and it begs the question, you know, we were just looking at that the church is constantly messing with things Joseph Smith said in history. Why don't they mess with Nephi? What well, I mean, you know, he, he's just a, pro if, if Joseph Smith, the, the, the most righteous man ever who exists on the world, if he's, if he's, if we're free to mess with what he's writing, why don't we change what Alma wrote? Uh, you know, so that that's, that's a, a it's an question. interesting question to me all right well that's a good i really am glad you included the original edition of the book of mormon in that list john i think that's a crucial source and resource for understanding mormonism for sure for sure yeah, yeah. um the our next one is the book of commandments 1833 edition um this is the earliest publication well this is the earliest uh published well no it's the earliest book that where they they brought together the revelations and, and and my hesitancy will make sense in a minute here so the book of commandments has a really fascinating story behind it of course um w w phelps uh one of the early members who had been sent to independence missouri where he set up a printing press um and he would print um leaf bill you know like they would give a speech and then he'd print it up and they'd tack it around town um, he also started a newspaper called the Evening and Morning Star, which is what we're going to talk about next. And he was printing the Book of Commandments, which was a collection of all the revelations that Joseph Smith had made at um, um, up to that time. And um, people uh, forget, because they always see it like um, John is showing it right now, the Book of Commandments is a tiny book. It's like a... It's like two and a half inches tall. It's, it's like this little tiny small thing. And um, they were printing... Um, this book, and they were up to Revelation 65 in the original book, when um, the 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 Missourians went and ransacked um, W. W. Phelps Printing Press in Independence, Missouri, and so they 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 tipped over the printing press. This would this would be um, 1832 or 1833, July 20th, um, and and then those two um, young women. Um, famously grabbed the the pages that had been printed and ran out into the wheat fields or whatever and hid from the mob. And um, that's what those pages were used in the original run. I We are not exactly sure how many original copies of this book there are, and it's complicated by the fact that a lot of them are in the hands of private rich people. 
If you can find an original copy of the Book of Commandments that is the single most valuable book in Mormonism um, that's, that's, that's really out there, I think there's less than 30 of them in existence. Most of them are in the vault in, in, in the church. Um, so an intact copy of the book um, is buku valuable. That being said, we you can buy reprints of it that will show you exactly, you know, um, word for word, page for page, what, what the, the original said. Um, this book was, um, replaced by the Doctrine and Covenants, which was published in 1835. We're, we're going to get to that in, in a minute, but, um, I, I, I really like this book because it shows a lot of the evolution of the, the, the doctrine. And there's been many Mormon expression episodes, and I'm sure there've been many Mormon stories episodes where this has been used as a source to show how revelations were changed because even between 1833 and 1835, they went and had to revise the doctrine quite a bit because even in this, those two years, they had changed what they, what they believed, which is really important because Mormons believe this was direct revelation. There's only how many in the, in the, in the Salt Lake Doctrine and Covenants was 132, 133 revelations. I can't remember the, the, the full number. So, I mean, God has only spoke to us in this modern time a very, very short number of times. And the almost all of Joseph Smith's revelations came from this early period. When By the time he got to Nauvoo, Joseph Smith was not writing revelations from God anymore. So, so there, there is such a limited amount of information that if you're a believer that God gave us, and here it is, as it was published and sent out to the church and sent out to the world. So, so it is, it is a book that every Mormon should really almost know by heart. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to uh, echo what you're saying, John, and kind of give credit where credit is due. This was one of the major uh, initiatives that Gerald and Sandra Tanner engaged in during their, I don't know, 40 year ministry. And if you get the book, uh, we'll, we'll have made it, may even add this to the show notes. If you get the book lighthouse, kind of the history of Gerald and Sandra Tanner, there's an entire chapter on Gerald and Sandra, uh, trying to find what microfish or whatever of the original book of commandments so that they could then, you know, make a, a purchasable copy, um, of the book. And, and then Gerald just does this meticulous comparing of uh, the 1833 Book of Commandments with the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants. And of course, you'll find things like in the, in the Book of Commandments, polygamy was literally forgiven, forbidden. It was like, I think it was DNC or, or Book of Commandments section 101, where it, it basically says, we are not to practice polygamy as a church. It's, it's forbidden. Um, and, and and then later that's taken out. I think that actually persists to later Doctrine and Covenants, and it's, it's taken out in a much later version of the Doctrine and Covenants once they came to Salt Lake. But for me, the most memorable changes are around priesthood because the, the priesthood, the offices of the priesthood, the roles of the offices of the priesthood are very, very different. Um, between the 1833 Book of Commandments and the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants. And it just so happens to change along with Joseph Smith's interactions with Sidney Rigdon and his evolving view of authority. And as people start challenging Joseph Smith's authority, then he needs ways to solidify um, that authority. And so, you know, why would any of that be, been changing? Why wouldn't God have gotten that right from the start? You know, those are the types of questions that this book helps us see more clearly. So I do want to recommend the Tanner's work and also LDS discussions. This series we're doing with Mike, we, we have an entire episode or two uh, that talks about uh, Joseph Smith's changing revelations and the differences between uh, the book of commandments and the doctrine and covenants really, really crucial, important stuff, John. So I'm, I'm glad you're mentioning it. Kara, is this stuff you've, you've been aware of or learned about or studied at all? Or, um, a little bit. Yeah. And I think it all just goes along with the theme of general logic tells us, all right, was he writing as a man then and then writing? But that was writing as God then or writing as God now. Well, how do we know when he's writing as God and which revelations to pay attention to or not? Or is he just making it all up? Yeah. And, and Kara, part of what's infuriating that the Tanners help illustrate is that he even changes revelations. So like he had the audacity to take a, you know, a fully written revelation that was written out 
edited and printed as God's revelation. And then he'll literally add and take away from that written revelation, totally altering its meaning in, in, in the 1835 version. And it's just like, is that how revelation works? Mm -hmm. Where God reveals it word for word, you print it. And then a couple years later, you add stuff and take stuff away that fundamentally transforms the meaning of the original revelation, oftentimes making it the opposite of what was said previously. I mean, is that how revelation works? I mean, it's He was just it's a maddening. vessel that can only be filled with so much oil or whatever <laughs> Holland said, that it's not our fault that we're finite vessels and that we sometimes spew bull crap. I don't know. Um, all right, John, are we, are we covering? Yeah, this? yeah, you guys are right on. And this yeah. is addressing Joe Shua. I hope I say your name correctly. Uh, uh, um, and he said that, you know, these aren't available in the Philippines. I believe that everything that we are talking about here is available online. It's all um, open source. The copyrights expired. And especially, yeah, I, I, I think... I think everything that I have on this list, except for the Skousen edition, but you can find other renditions of the early one, are, are all available for free if you want to read online. But but here's the most important thing I, I want to say. You have people like me or John or Kara or the Tanners saying all these things, and it's easy to dismiss us. You know, we're apostates, we're whatever. Please, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to say something that you will never hear a member of the Quorum of the Twelve say. Don't take my word for it. Mm -hmm. Go read it yourself. Don't listen to me. Um, I don't know anything. When when you when you see the Buddha kill him, go to the source document. Find out yourself. Read the book that Joseph Smith wrote. It, it's 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 super imperative. Because you're, you're, if you're still a believer, you're shaping your entire life and your relationship with your children and your parents and your neighbors and your friends. You're, you're potentially um, ruining people's lives over small things, over something that you have a responsibility to understand. Um, and, and for everybody who's been on a mission, I implore you, you have to repent in that you have to go read what you actually were out there teaching to unsuspecting people. It, it, it's, it's really important to me that people understand that we're not making this up, that, that you don't have to listen to any of us. You can go as, as we put, as I put the title of this, you can find it in their own words, the original sources. Yeah. And John, can I say yes? And I'm going to say yes. And only because, um, once you get the original sources, it, it you're probably going to have a hard time being able to really do a lot of these in-depth analyses and comparisons. And in care, maybe you can grab um, Mormonism, Shadow, and Reality over there. Oh, yeah. But it's also helpful to then, when you're looking at the original sources, to have someone like Gerald and Sandra Tanner actually do the work of showing you the discrepancies between the 1833 and the 1835 version. And what you can do is you can see what Gerald and Sandra Tanner did to show you the differences. And then you can look at the original sources and confirm that they're not just making stuff up. I and, read this and, book cover to cover. And Kara's got, so go ahead and show it, show it to the camera. Yeah. So like the table of contents, you'll find everything you need to know about the Book of Mormon, all the witnesses, all of Crowdry, the archaeology of the Book of Mormon, changes in history, all of the first vision, everything you need to know about Adam, God, doctrine, plural marriage, the manifesto. And my favorite part is about all of the original sources about the word of wisdom and where all of that came about. So whenever I need to write like a TikTok script, sometimes I just open this up and I can retell the history out of this. It's very accessible. As Show well. the cover. Show the cover. Yeah. Mormonism, shadow reality. And John, I hope you don't feel like I'm neutralizing or neutering the points you were making. Uh, oh, no, not at all. And um, I just decided to leave these sources out. There's actually, um, I, I mean, I don't want to cast shade on the Tanners. There's actually even better sources than the Tanners, more academic, scholarly, linear side-by-sides. Um of, like a dialogue of, or other that, that, that yeah and i i think i think in a future episode i want i want to um i want to um bring those up that will really help you and contextualize and explain everything that was going on but again i wanted to kind of reproduce my footsteps out of mormonism yeah. because the rule i gave myself in the beginning is i wouldn't read those i would only read the source things 
And and the, reading the source documents, by the way, uh, and when you first start, it gets kind of a little. It's a little bit foggy who all these people are. But as you as you if you read all ten sources that I have, you will get a really deep understanding of who these people were, how they interact with each other. Because you'll start to hear the names over and over again. You'll start to be able to put them together as to where they were and who Joseph Smith was was using as a scribe and who he is bouncing ideas off and and all that stuff. That's really important to understand. Um, um, the, the church. I love it. All right. So that's book of commandments. So that's number four, right? We're at four right. at 10. Is four, that right? Four. The, the, yep. And the next one, the evening and morning star. I already mentioned the evening and morning star when um, W.W. W. Phelps set up the printing press in 1832 in independence, Missouri. He started to produce a newspaper and it is this newspaper that got the, 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 the Mormons in big trouble. Um, so it was published from June 1832 to July 1833 when um, the printing press was flipped over. W.W. W. Phelps and others skedaddled out of town. Um, they were chased out by by the the, the mob, and the the first because uh, the whole conflicts in Missouri and the and the, and the church history um, are a little foggy for all of us unless you, you've read this stuff. Um, that's when they were chased out the first time. They went back to Kirtland. Um, and then they came back to far west and those other places where they went up to Nauvoo. But the first time they were chased out of out of uh, Missouri, it was really because they were agitating for the release of um, slaves. For 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 one thing, in, in the early days of the church, the church was anti-slavery. It reversed its position, and under Brigham Young, the church actually the Mormon Church had black slaves. Um, um, the church itself did. So, so, um, but that's, that's neither here nor there. That's down the road. So they were agitating and then Missouri was a very, um, it was, it, it, it was a rough and tumble place. Um, and in a coming episode, we're going to deal a little bit with, um, um, the relationships with the Indians a little bit, but you know, th this, this was, this was the raw and dirty frontier and already the war, um, the civil war tensions were brewing even this early between the slave states and the and the and the non-slave states. So you have all these Yankees coming down into into the South, which was upsetting to the to the locals to begin with. And then they start talking to all this fancy talk, and they're going to take over and they're going to buy up all the property. And um, so they got um, they got um, chased out. So the Evening and Morning Star. Um, one one of the reasons I loved this one. This one really, really, you know, the first one, I, I saw the humanity of, of Joseph Smith, but this was a newspaper. And what you really see in there is, 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 and it's, by the way, it's the source for most of the, the, the book of commandments. Um, and, and there's even changes oftentimes between the evening and morning star publication. And then the book of commandment publication that came just a little bit later. They, they never, Joseph Smith never stopped messing with, with the previous stuff. Um, this is where you get a real taste of how, of, of how Mormons viewed the world. Um, there are two like re reoccurring columns that, that, that appear in it. And one is signs of the times and the other one is worldly matters. Um, and you know, they'll talk about like a, a outbreak of cholera in India. And they're always like, this is because, because I, uh, this is kind of glossed over, but these guys believed that they were in the latter days, not 180 years before the latter days. They believed Jesus was just around the corner. And, and this newspaper really re reflects that, um, that ap apocryphal millennialist vibe. And it's hard to get a sense of how dark they viewed the rest of the world without reading this. So you get to see advertisements and you get to see, um, what people were saying in church, their sermons, the revelations, the interpretations. This gives you a broader view of how Mormonism was processed in the first um, in the first years uh, um, from Missouri. Okay. Um, yeah. So evening and uh, evening and morning star. And again, we're showing it here on the screen for anyone who wants to get a book copy of it. But all of that can be available in the public domain. Um, yep. just, just through Googling. Yeah. And, and, and hymns too. You can see some of the early, the earliest, um, um, text of the hymns and, and there's nothing sacred in Mormonism that can't be changed. So there's even catalogs of changes on, on those. And I, and again, like you're talking the, the tanners have gone through 
And um, I never met Gerald. He was he had passed away long before my time. But the man's mind is just incredible. The amount of material he got through and published in his lifetime just just blows me away. Yeah. Okay. Right. Number six, the messenger and advocate. So um, after they went back to um, they 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 left. They were chased out of Missouri, out of the, the promised land. Then um, they went back to um, Kirtland. And, um, they, um, this was published, this was a Kirtland, um, newspaper that, that, that went after Evening and Morning Star, and it was published from October 1834 to September of 1837, at which time the next publication was called the Elder's Journal. Now, I have a copy of the Elder's Journal. Um, I was looking online to see if I could find one. It is kind of a rare book, um, so I left it out of this list, if you can find it. Um, by all means, it's it's another one in sequence, but it's not part of this list because it because it's a little bit harder to find. Um, uh, their reasoning for ending the evening and morning star and starting the the messenger and advocate is they wanted to focus on Ohio instead of instead of Missouri. Um, the first edition was published by um, Cowdery, who later turned it over to um, John Whitmer, and they were assisted by W. W. Phelps, who had been publishing the book down in um, Missouri. Um, the, um, and then in 1837, the printing press was sold to Warren Cowdery, um, Oliver's brother, um, but they didn't like it. And then they, they re re retired it. Um, just as a, a word of warning, the term messenger and advocate has been used multiple times over the years, um, by both the reorganized church and the Salt Lake branch. Um, so if you go search for messenger and advocate, you'll see a lot of different things, but, but, um, this, this here that we have is the original um copy of the messenger and advocate again um i i i i pick these as sources i don't i don't have anything like earth shattering to say about the messenger and advocate except you know you'll see the the revelations that are published before they're in the book like the doctrine and covenants but they're in context that you can see what they were talking about what they were doing what conferences they were having the people who are writing things, it really gives you a good sense of what was on the mind of the of the early church. This is why, for example, I can say without hesitation that the early Mormons were Trinitarian. And part of it is if you read these sources, you'll find they're they're consistently Trinitarian in everything. Um, and then it's just modern Mormons who are confused because they haven't read this stuff. They haven't looked at it. Got it. Okay. All right. Uh, this next one is a hoot. Yeah, it, so like these are these are like newspapers, right? These are like periodicals. Yeah. And I'm just trying to imagine. So you sat down and would like read July 12th, you know, 1837, and you would like really read these articles from you the periodicals. You still got women? Cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I don't I don't claim to have read everything in the, in the. Oh no no no! I just mean you found it valuable to go. Was it? Did you more look up things that you would see referenced elsewhere, or did you sit down and just try and read from these, picking, you know, picking different parts? Um, Messenger and Advocate. I mean, if I'm going to be perfectly honest with you, is not one that I ever sat down. I think I have. I, I'm looking at my books. I think I have copies of it now, but I didn't in the in the early days. I had found a copy of Evening and Morning Star that uh, was this big red edition that I have that was full size. And, um, so, um, I could pull that out and it just, I, it, it just, it, it, it felt like I was touching the past and, and you have to remember, I was reading this as, as, as a, a member. So uh, luckily, you know, my, my wife at the time, Zilpha, she was interested and it was just like this. I, I, I would, I would say it was akin to like digging in your backyard and finding a stegosaurus. You know, you're just digging. And you're like, oh my god, look at this! Did you see this? So some of them I would skim, but um, or you'd, you'd you'd see the headlines and 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 read it through. But I, I just the joy it gave me. I, I it's 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 not it's not like a, a big negative thing. It's it's this this hollow, vacuous shell of a religion I was in suddenly had blood. It was it was pumped to life. And and by by reading their newspaper, you could see that. Mm. I like uh, this one comment. I don't know what happened to my voice, but 
Hey, there I am. Uh, somebody said that this uh, episode is John Larson's uh, villain origin story. <laughs> Fred. Uh, yeah. And then the most boring uh, origin story of a villain ever, where you're just reading in a library for hours and hours, very slowly, <laughs> like mutate. But we're all a benefit of that. Well, where the where are the murders? Where where are the murders in the debauchery, John Larson? Well, you you know, in some of these books, you'll see fist fights, and you'll see accusations of adultery. They they love to accuse each other of adultery all the time. Um, that's why it's laughable when we we're talking earlier about the church blocking things out because because there's a lot of people who get their names. Uh, they in the early church, they did not have a problem excommunicating people and then going to the going to the newspaper or to the or to the pulpit and saying, we just excommunicated that asshole for cheating on his wife, you know, so the, it, it's, it's, um, it's fun. Yeah. They were, they were ruffians back then. Like again, going back to what you're saying about the, like the Q15 now they want to look all dignified and stuff, but like these were frontier ruffian folks that were drinking wine in the temple and getting into fist fights and having endowment ceremonies inside of cinnamon whiskey. Like you get into that stuff and it's like, this was a dope cult. Sounds cool. It's got boring well, after a while. But. Like at the last meeting in um, the, the story, the last meeting in the Kirtland temple um, before Joseph Smith, that night Joseph Smith had to hightail it out of town. One of his bodyguards tossed somebody through the fucking window you know and and you know you, you go to conference and the idea that they picked this guy up by his suspenders and just crashed him through a window like like it, these guys were 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 so different than what you've been told they were but but in the most charming way yeah like brigham young with his bowie knives yeah charming uh -huh. yeah <laughs> hey really quickly just as a you know we we don't do product placement or product endorsements here or have commercial sponsors. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I'm just going to do a quick shout out. We're, we're, uh, we would really appreciate it if everyone on YouTube would take a moment to subscribe to the Mormon stories podcast, YouTube channel, either now in the live stream or later when you're watching, um, that really helps with the algorithms. It'll keep you up to date when we release or schedule a new episode. And, um, it'll help us reach our goal. And the, and the bigger the influence we have, the more subscribers, the more reach we're going to have to be able to impact people. So please do your part and subscribe to our YouTube channel. While you're at it, subscribe to the Nuance Ho YouTube channel. Oh, thanks. And Nemo the Mormon and Zelf on the Shelf. All of those channels and many others are worth supporting. All right. Back to you, John Larson. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So the next one is John Whitmer's history. This one is, this one is surprisingly important. Um, John Whitmer was um, one of the eight witnesses, and of course his brother David Whitmer was one of the three witnesses to the Book of Mormon. Um, and he has a revelation directed to him specifically in the Doctrine and Covenants. In fact, it's still in the Doctrine and Covenants, the Salt Lake version today, it's section 47, in which um, that David Whitmer was instructed by God himself, the big guy, through Joseph Smith, to um for him to write and keep a regular history of the church um and everybody who's in the church today every missionary carrying around their triple combination is carrying around a printed copy of this revelation so i was saying before that god has said very few things to mormons in um since the restoration and one of the things that he said, which is one of the only 132 revelations, or whatever the number is in the in the Doctrine and Covenants, is a commandment for D John Whitmer to keep the history of the official history of the church. So I would say, from God's perspective, that's really so important that every single one of you probably has multiple copies of the revelation given to John Whitmer in your house today. Are you being sarcastic, John Larson? Not at all. I, if 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 Mormonism is true, then this book should be very, very, very important to you, because God, according to Mormons, they tell me he's omniscient. That means of of the story of John Whitmer that we're going to talk about here in a few seconds. God knew everything that would happen. God knew exactly what would happen to John Whitmer. God knew exactly when the book would be published. God knew exactly that, all of it, and God still chose to have Joseph Smith receive a revelation on March 8th, 1831, instructing um, John Whitmer to keep this history. Okay. I, this is, this is Mormonism, right? This is not, this is not me. 
All right. Well, I, I'm glad you know it's in this important book. So, so, and, and, um, uh, John Whitner was very, very important. Um, he, he was part of the Missouri contingent that founded Far West. Um, and, um, so he and Oliver Cowdery and later W.W. Phelps, in a, I think it was 1836. So, so 1833, 1834, they're, they're, they're in Missouri. They hightail it out of Missouri. But during that early Missouri period, Joseph Smith and, and um, Sidney Rigdon and those guys were still in Kirtland. So there was uh, Ohio and Missouri. They lost all their Missouri presence, and then they went back in about 1836. Um, his story and all this time he was supposed to keep this, um, history of the church and he really very much copied the, um, language of the book of Mormon or he was, he was trying to. So he, he writes in this history all the time and it came to pass that, and, and uses that, that, that biblical language fused on top of his like frontier English. It's, 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 it's charming and delightful. Um, however, Joseph Smith came into Far West in 1838. Um, well, 1838 was when I, I referenced this before. Joseph Smith had started a bank, an illegal bank in Kirtland, um, the Kirtland Safety Society. And, and when they had applied for a banking license from the government and it was denied, they went and bought a little rubber stamp with the word anti on it. So they took their dollar bills that they'd already had printed up and they stamped the Kirtland Anti-Banking Society on those dollars. If you have one with the stamp on them, they're worth a lot of money. Um, so they had done all this speculation, the, 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 both in, in New York uh, well, in New York and in Kirtland and again in Nauvoo and again in Salt Lake City, church leaders were always involved in land speculation. It's probably more than anything what got Joseph Smith killed is his trying to do um, um, make money off of property. But the whole thing fell apart in Kirtland in 1838. And again, Joseph Smith hightailed it out of town on a horse in the middle of the night uh, with just two of his bodyguards. He left his babies and his wife behind. Son of a bitch. Um, uh, he, he, he really was kind of a dick. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Joseph Smith was not that great of a guy. And, and he heads out to far West by this time. Like people, people have lost money. They've lost property. They're, they're, they're having these troubles. So Joseph Smith rolls into far West and he excommunicates the entire Whitmer family. And he excommunicates, um, he excommunicates Oliver Cowdery and he excommunicates W.W. Phelps on March 10th, 1838. And then Sidney Rigdon gives what's called the salt sermon. And one of the things that he does in that salt sermon is he puts a warning to the dissenters that was taken by the people at the time to be these guys. And Sidney Rigdon basically, um, basically threatened their life. So, the Whitmers and Oliver Cowdery and those guys fled across the county line into um, Ray County. And I believe that that was the moment that started the 1838 Mormon War. Um, and it was a hot shooting war, but more like, a, you know, it wasn't with like a cavalry charges. What would happen on both sides is the Mormons would go to find either a, a dissident or a non-Mormon and they would put, you know, tar on their faces and they'd go and they'd, they'd steal their saddles and their cattle and their horses. And then they would burn down the house. And then the, the, the Missourians would do the same thing. And so they were doing all these raids and people were getting really, really nervous. Um, so, so, um, John Whitmer <laughs> was one of the dissidents who was in open warfare with Joseph Smith and crew, but he was still keeping the history of the church during this time. So it's a really fascinating book. He, he, he kept records and then it, it, it went, um, it, it, it has big gaps in it. And then he wrote it kind of all the way up to 1847. Um, but he explains from his perspective what happened in 1838. So that's one of the ways we kind of, we know about this 
because there were there were people who were in, involved. That's what the church has this official narrative of all of these different things that happen in in the church. Here you have what is ostensibly the official history of the church that was commissioned by God Himself, the great Elohim, and it really does document um, what Joseph Smith was, was was doing to these guys. It was eventually acquired by the reorganized church, and um, it has been published. The best version of it, the one that I have, is called From Historian to Dissent, um, um, Dissident, the Book of John Whitmer, which has a lot more of the um, exposition and explanation of what's going on. Some of these um, books, the, 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 what the scholars did is they went through and sort of explained, but that one is out of print, and I looked the cheapest copy I could find out. There was like 50 or 60 bucks. So if you're really into this stuff, it's worth getting a copy of that book, but otherwise you can just get a copy. I think we, we displayed it. It's, it's online of the, the book. It's, I think it's original. It's actually called the book of John Whitmer, you know, as kind of taking on the nomenclature of the book of Alma, the book of Nephi, that, that sort of stuff. Fascinating book. And, and really seeing Joseph Smith, um, sideways from somebody who was part of the inner circle, then out of the inner circle, really interesting. You know, John, you, you know, there's a, there's at least two things that come up for me as I'm hearing you talk about this. The first is, how mind-blowing is it? Like, you can't get closer to the founding of Mormonism than to, than to be uttering the names John Whitmer and David Whitmer and Oliver Cowdery. And I'm just trying to imagine, like, if, if Russell M. Nelson today became prophet and all of a sudden was excommunicating Down H. Oaks, Jeffrey Holland, Bednar, you know, maybe the first excommunication you'd go, oh, I wonder what, you know, I wonder what Oaks did. But after like the second or third, you would probably turn around and say, now, why is Nelson doing this? Is there something going on where Nelson's trying to clean house because he's trying to cover up something that he's done? You know, that's what you would wonder if, if the top leader of the Mormon church today started excommunicating all the top leaders. Well, that's exactly what happened back in Joseph Smith's day. Um, you know, and, and and so, you know, take it as just a question. Don't take John's word for it. Like you say, John, don't take care of my word for it. Go learn why Oliver Cowdery was excommunicated. Why, you know, we we lift him up. The Mormon church lifts him up as one of the three witnesses to the Book of Mormon. Must be a credible guy or the church wouldn't name him as one of the three witnesses to the Book of Mormon. Why was he excommunicated in 1838? Kara, I bet you know the answer. He was writing a letter to his brother, and he's like, hot goss on the scene. Prophet Joseph Smith, I saw him banging his adopted teenage daughter, Fanny, in the barn. And I am like, what is going on? And he's like, keep it on the down low, or you're being excommunicated. But, bro, <laughs> I've got to tell you, I don't know about this prophet anymore. You let the cat out of the bag. <laughs> excommunicated. Kara, <laughs> Kara, have I taught you nothing? <laughs> I am disappointed. Is that not new. You always have to say Oliver Cowdery accused Joseph Smith of banging Fanny. Yeah, <laughs> those are the better words I could have chosen. Rewind. Let me do it again, please, sir. <laughs> so yeah, and and like yeah. So why why was David Whitmer? Why was John Whitmer excommunicated? Why was William Law in the first presidency excommunicated? Why was John C. Bennett excommunicated? I can act all of it out for you. Yeah. No, but but I mean like you know, either God called these people by revelation or he didn't. And if so many of them get excommunicated, either God's a really bad choice as to who he wants leading the church and being witnesses for the early uh, years of the church, or maybe Joseph Smith is cleaning house because he's doing some things wrong, doing some shady stuff. And he, he wants to, uh, he wants to put the kibosh on any dissent. That's the first thing, John Larson, that kind of your, you know, your discussion, this John Whitmer book kind of reminds me of. The other thing is to pay attention to the documents that these dissenters, former First Presidency members, former apostles, former um, witnesses to the Book of Mormon, pay attention to the documents that they publish. And for me, John Larson, I'll just say there's two that are essential. One is uh, a, an episode of Mormon Expression that we're going to ask Maven or, or Kara to list in the show notes. It's the Novel Expositor. You just got to go read the Novel Expositor published by William Law, who was in the first presidency at the end of Joseph Smith's reign in Nauvoo. 
and read about what William Law says Joseph Smith was doing in Nauvoo. And there's no other way to read it than as sex trafficking teenage women from vulnerable teenage women from Western Europe to Nauvoo. There's, there's no way, no other way to describe it. Um, in addition to creating the kingdom of God on earth and having himself crowned a king and all sorts of other crazy things, read William Law's novel Expositor. It is going to tell you a lot. And the other thing that you really want to read, and we've covered this on LDS discussions, is David Whitmer's An Address to All Believers in Christ. Because what you'll find is that not only can you compare DNC, oh, sorry, Book of Commandments from 1833 with the Doctrine and Covenants from 1835, you can not only compare those two and realize that they're messed up, you've got people like David Whitmer, you know, one of the three witnesses to the Book of Mormon again, publishing a pamphlet saying, hey, all that stuff Joseph Smith te- taught later that appears in the Doctrine and Covenants later, you've got one of the witnesses to the Book of Mormon saying, Joseph changed his own revelations. You can't do that. Joseph has corrupted and perverted the original pure gospel that he received through revelation from God, and that's not how revelation works. And so you can't, on the one hand, lift up Oliver Cowdery and David Whitmer as witnesses to the Book of Mormon and then completely ignore what they actually wrote once they were kicked out or or disaffected or once they apostatized or were excommunicated and then publish their accounts of what was going on. You, you can't have your cake and eat it too. If you pick up one one um, side of the stick, you got to pick up the other side of the stick. Now, John Larson, am I am I getting any of this right? No, you preach the word. I love myself a good John DeLynn rant. <laughs> okay. No, you're 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 spot on. I mean, because in 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 reality, Joseph Smith um, instituted a church um, that that was the the and, and there's a lot of history there that that from the New York and Kirtland period. Um, uh, period. And then he went to Nauvoo and he completely flipped it on its head. And most of these early guys that, that we're talking about were uh, annoyed and upset. And they all wrote like Joseph Smith wrote, lost almost all of his high level followers. And they are consistent in their criticism. And, you know, the church always likes to point out that they never, um, that they never disavowed the fraudulent part that they were part of, which is the, you know, the, the witnessing, um, but, but if we're to believe them on that point, like we're, that we're to believe that they really were witnesses to the angels and the plates, then we also need to give them credence for the things that they said about Joseph Smith, because they're consistent and they're backed up. It's like you say about the Nauvoo Expositor, the, the old Nauvoo Expositor episode is, is only um, valuable because what we do is we go through and show that everything that William Law wrote in there can be validated by outside sources. It was 100% the truth, yet Joseph Smith still had his thugs go um, you know, flip the, the, the printing press, which I've said before you know, the two bookends of Mormonism that really you have Joseph Smith starting this religion and then the, the printing press gets flipped. And, 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 uh, and when I say flip, they would actually throw it into the dirt and scatter the type. Uh, they, they flipped it over in Missouri and then Joseph Smith did the exact same thing, which, um, um, was instrumental in, um, him being locked up in prison and then, um, killed in a gunfight, um, <clears throat> which is important. Joseph Smith died in a gunfight. Yeah. Can I ask a question? You sure did. Oh, please, Kara. We love your What questions. is the name of the book that Oaks was co-authoring about the Nauvoo Expositor? Uh, did, mm, I have to you Google that. that. You guys mentioned it Car- earlier. Carthage Conspiracy. Carthage yeah. Conspiracy, yeah. yeah. What? And my question is around the same thing, like, Mormon apologists and apostles, they can spin things that look so obviously wrong to us that they can write an entire book and make it faith-promoting that Oaks can write that book. And they could say that, yeah, they needed to do this to keep the peace or like, yeah, Joseph needed to excommunicate these people because they were troublemakers. Like, is there just like this common theme with especially like the modern day church that anything that looks like it's a little bit nefarious? They're like, this is what we had to do to preserve the authenticity of the church. We had to kick out all of the people who were saying stuff about Joseph's character. And all that matters is that, you know, he's a prophet and all the bad people have gone away. Shh little darling they're all gone now that's kind of how modern church rolls yeah making any sense i mean you're telling me an attorney 
uh, can't always be believed about <laughs> what they say. Uh, hey, we, you know, attorneys can be good people, John Larson. We have listeners that are attorneys. I've, I've, I've heard that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you, we like you, Colby. We love our, we love Radio Free Mormon. <laughs> Shout out to Mormonism Live. Subscribe to Mormonism Live. <laughs> Everybody makes fun of attorneys until they need one. But take, <laughs> take up personal, personal experience. Attorneys can be super useful and helpful. <laughs> yeah, I mean everybody's moral until they're not. Okay. Oh, oh. All right. Let's uh, let's go forward. Um, so the next one, um, number eight, lectures on faith. Um, originally this document was just called on faith. Um, and when we say doctrine and covenants, um, the, we talked a minute ago that in 1833, they published the book of commandments, which of course got interrupted, um, by the mob in Missouri. So they went back and then they, they recompiled it. Joseph Smith had already started changing the revelations. They added a few more and they republished it in conjunction with lectures on faith. There are seven lectures widely believed to have been written by Sidney Rigdon. It matches his style. But um, Joseph Smith was the kind of shyster who gloms on to people. Um, so he'll find, he'll find, um, you know, well, let's, he'll find a Mark, like a, a Martin Harris, and then he'll be with him and tell him all sorts of great things. Oh, you're the best. God loves you. Here's this revelation. And he'll use up all of his money. And then he'll go to, you know, Oliver Cowdery. And then he goes to Sidney Rigdon. And then he goes to William McClellan. And then he goes, you know, it's just it's just one person after the other, after the other, after the other. Um, um, and and in, in standard sociopathic uh, practice, he'll use you until you're no good. And then 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 he'll throw you out. So lectures on faith was the doctrine part of doctrine and covenants. So when that book was named doctrine and covenants, doctrine was the lectures on faith and covenants was the revelation. Um, the, the, this book was presented before the general conference of the church in, um, 1835 and accepted as canon. That's important because the church continues to lie about that point. Um, there are seven lectures, um, that are about theology. A lot of them are about God. And the reason these became a kind of a pariah is because God in the lectures on faith is a spirit. And it very much matches a Trinitarian view of, 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 of Jesus. But it, it says specifically that, that, um, God does not have a body. He is a spirit in there. This book it was interesting because because it was such part of the canon and came about under um, Joseph Smith. It stuck around for a long time. The name change to Lectures on Faith happened in 1876 when it was edited by Orson Pratt. The reorganized church removed the um, On Faith from the Doctrine and Covenants in 1897. The Utah branch removed it in 1921. Um, and the church then began claiming it wasn't actual canon, it wasn't actual doctrine, which is almost 100 years, like 85 years after it had been written. And and the year 1921 is significant because um, the Reed Smoot hearings, you know, happened between um, 1904 and 1907. And what we have is is the, the church renouncing polygamy on paper in 1890, and because of that, Utah was granted a statehood in 1896, but they were still practicing post-manifesto polygamy on the down low. And then with the Reed Smoot hearings, they all got dragged in before Congress and said, "You promised us. You it was it was contingent upon this this that 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 we withdrew federal officers, we returned land, we removed the the warrants. They're out for church leaders because you said to us that you were not going to practice polygamy. And of course they were. They got raked over the coals. Joseph F. Smith had to admit that he never spoke to Jesus, that he never had any revelations. It's all there in the Smoot hearings. So the church had a crisis um, after all that happened. Is then Who are we? And that's when the modern um, theology started taking shape. So by 1821, um, they had, by 1921, they'd sort of redefined the notion of the Godhead because they had, they had early Smith, they had late Smith, they had 
They had Young and Adam God and all that kind of stuff. They had lectures on faith. They had all these contradictory sources that couldn't be aligned. So the church needed it to go away. So they just removed it from the doctrine and covenants. Um, uh, anyway, that's that's my that's my take on it. But um, the, these seven lectures on faith really give you a good understanding of the of the Kirtland period doctrine on on God and man and and man's relationship to God, or I should say, humankind's relationship to God. Um, and so the, they're they're a really important read to understand the development of early Mormonism. Yeah, thank you, John. And uh, again, why would God put um, the lectures in faith in the doctrine and covenants and call it doctrine if he was then going to have it removed later. That makes no, that makes no sense, but it, it makes total sense. Um, and it's just like an extra layer of validity because what do we know, Cara Burrell, I, I know you're down on this. What do we know about um, Joseph Smith's evolving view of, of God and the Godhead? What do we know? You're muted. I'm muted because um. I was chewing a taco. <laughs> Don't worry, guys. I was fed tonight. Um, what do we know about Joseph's evolving view on the Godhead? That yeah. it started off as a Trinitarian view and then evolved uh, later to say that, oh, they're actually one God. Yeah, it's a pretty unique doctrine. Uh, you only find it over here. God, Jesus, same person. That's how it started. He starts out as seeing God and Jesus as one person. And then over time, as he gets into Nauvoo or even Lake Kirtland, He's seeing God and Jesus as two separate people, right? Yeah. 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 And so it makes total sense why the first vision changes, right? Yeah. And it also makes sense why uh, people are like, he was just so hated and persecuted because he uh, uh, he was telling people that they were separate people. Bitch, he didn't even tell anybody. And if he did, he would have said that they were one person. Shut up. Another push of the microphone. Yeah. So the book, so the, so if you want, if you want multiple evidences of Joseph Smith's evolving theology, you you just look at the you look at his first vision that changes between the 1832 version and the 1838 version, going from a single Lord in the 1832 version to God and Jesus the Son in 1838. But you don't just have that; you also have the Book of Mormon, which in the original version of the Book of Mormon. Um, you know, God and Jesus are one. Mary is the the son. Mary is the mother of God, not the mother of the Son of God. Right. And then you've got later versions of the Book of Mormon where that gets changed. Well, if that weren't enough, if I were Ron Popeil, I would say, and yet there's <laughs> more. We have the lectures on faith that again showed a Trinitarian view of the Godhead that was that was incorporated into sacred Holy scripture, doctrine and covenants. It was the very doctrine of the doctrine and covenants. And then it gets removed because, uh Oh, Joseph changed his view on the Godhead. Like how many witnesses to Joseph changing things do we need to realize either he wasn't a prophet to begin with or God changes his mind. I mean, what, what do we need? It's called a restoration because so many truths had been lost. <laughs> God's like, we're restoring the church. Also, JK. Yeah, it's, he's constantly restoring the re rest restoration, right? Like the restoration is constantly needing restoration. When yeah, is the restoration, I, John Larson, when is the restoration stop needing additional restorations? Well, you know, like the Book of Mormon um, was had a lifespan of well you know 600 bc to, to 1830 before it started getting changed um the bible you know if you listen to believers goes from 4000 bc to you know what's interesting is that the length of time that that we as humans believe that um a revelation is good is shrinking it's and 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 people have pointed this out like i struggle to articulate what Mormons are doing today because it changes so quickly, like literally like two, three years, like the, the changes just piling up on top of each other. Um, so you guys are absolutely right. I want to, I want to point out how apologists lie and I'm not going to call it anything but lies. So we have basically eight versions of the first vision and some of those versions of the first vision come from the sources we're talking about tonight. So you can actually read them the way they were published in the Evening and Morning Star. Right. So 
if you take all of those out of these sources and then put them in a spreadsheet and line them up, and then you start saying, well, this actually means this, and this actually means this, and this actually means this, you can create this smoke and mirrors view that makes it sound, it's a completely unconvincing to me even doing that, makes it sound like there is a consistent story. But you can only do that by not reading or paying attention. This is why I get so frustrated with apologists. Because if they read these things that we're talking about tonight, and you could easily read all 10 books I'm giving you tonight in six months, no problem. This is not that many pages. If you read these, you absolutely know that the first vision was consistent with everything else that they were teaching at the time. So it's not just the evolution that comes through from the first vision. You put those in context and you can see that it was absolutely consistent with what they believed. So what apologists do is they pull it out of context, scramble them up, compare them to each other, and they, they tell you a story about it. And the story is a lie. It's not, it's not real. And you can find it by just reading what people actually said and believed at the time. And in the age of the Internet, this is all available. And John, while we're on the subject of, of Mormon apologists, I went ahead and just Googled like, hey, why was the lectures on faith removed? And even in Wikipedia, which of course the Mormon church has apologists paid to edit and monitor these Wikipedia pages and make sure that they reflect as faithful and as apologetic um, of a narrative of the church history as possible. I, I checked out Wikipedia and just asked, you know, why were the lectures of faith removed? And, and you get back the apologetic um, line. And I just want to I want to run this by your BS meter, John Larson. And if, Kara, you want to add something as well, I'd love to hear it. But here's what it says. It says, the committee proposed to delete the lectures on faith on the grounds that they were lessons prepared for use in the School of the Elders, conducted in Kirtland, Ohio, during the winter of 1834 to 1835, but they were never presented to nor accepted by the church as being otherwise than theological lectures or lessons. So, John Larson, I say to you, they were never voted on by the church membership, and they were never voted on or accepted as being anything other than mere theological le uh, lectures or lessons. So, no harm, no foul. I would say they were voted on by the members. I think that's a misdirection. And the 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 line that says they were just written only for those lessons. What's your source? Let's see it. I, I you, you otherwise you're just making shit up again. Um, you know it, it it was published. It was canonized. It was it was published by the church as canon for uh, ninety years. Um, and then they suddenly say, oh, these were just lessons, 1834 to 1835. They were undoubtedly presented that way. I could say the same thing about everything in the Doctrine and Covenants. It came out and it was published in the Evening and Morning Star or Messenger and Advocate. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a false argument without any source. I, I want the source where they say this is only for this thing and not used um, um, otherwise outside of that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what, what else do you need than the church publishing a set of scripture, calling it Doctrine and Covenants? It's approved by Joseph. It's paid for by the church. They call it Doctrine and Covenants. It includes the lectures on faith. What else do you, do you Kara, do we need actual members of the church voting to approve that? No, but the church has a narrative that they have everything under control. Nothing's on fire here. And then they're just like burning documents, burning documents. Yeah, nothing's changed, right? Uh the gospel's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God never changes, right? That's the hope. That's kind of what you're sold is like, again, restoration. Again, everything's on fire back here, but just stay looking, not the person behind the, yeah. the curtain filling the livers. Yeah. Me, me, me. John, do you like reading lectures on faith? Was it interesting to you? Uh, they're a little, I find Rigdon to be a, a yawner. Um, I, I find him to be snobby and sort of, um, uh, about kind of the things people say about me. I say about Sidney Rigdon. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Rigdon wow. is an interesting character. Um, he is uh, his own thing. Like, and the church has tried to make him go away as much as they can. Um, it's something that needs a lot of time spent on to unravel the man Sidney Rigdon. 
Um, uh, but, you know, he was clearly driving doctrine for a while there until Joseph Smith got sick of him. Um, but, you know, he's got different philosophical themes that show up and themes he developed later. It's, it's kind of a complicated thing. And, and you know, the church uses that, complica that complicated nature of things to obfuscate. So it's, it's, um, it, it'll be interesting to, for anybody reading this to see, you know, kind of how that stuff was, was injected. But doctrinally, I don't find Rigdon as interesting as I find Smith. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, number nine. What do we got at number nine? Number nine, the Far West Record, the Minutes of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, 1830 to 1844. This was um, compiled by Lyndon Cook. You've, um, he was a history professor at UVU. He is still alive. Um, he, I think he's retired, and he also has remained. Oh, he was, he was, uh, yeah, he also has remained faithful. Um, the Far West record is just, is, is minutes from the early time of the church all the way up to 1844. There are big gaps in there. There are minutes from meetings. I do believe, if I remember right, the, when Joseph Smith and his brother got into a fist fight in a priesthood meeting is in this book. It, 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 it talks about that. Um, but it's a really easy read. It was one of the first things I, that I just, I always just chuckles a minute, um, as, as you see what was going on. But it also gives you a good idea of, you know, like they would meet a lot in the winter um, in, in the upper room of the store because they weren't out in the fields. And, and you can kind of get a sense for the timing of, of, of how things would go, you know, and they would, they would, it would sit in the room and they would drink whiskey and chew tobacco and they would have um, all these different, you know, in-depth discussions. They'd talk about this stuff from morning to night and then, you know, uh, William McClellan would say something like, well, what if it was that God actually meant this? And then he'd go home and come back the next day. And Joseph said, I had a dream last night. And God says exactly what you just said last night. Um, so it's, 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 it's really a fascinating um, book. It's, it's easy to read cause it's just, it's just minutes, but it, it gives you, it gives you an idea of, of how the church was actually operating. Okay. So that's far West. The Far West Record. Far West and Record. Uh, it's about ten bucks too. I'm sorry, I just have the voice of Keith Erickson, the like one of the church historians or apologists in my head. He has these great lines. He's such a oh, he's such a dork. And he'll say stuff like, Maybe, you know, we need to have a little humility and realize that we just misunderstood the way that prophets are actually supposed to be, you know, that line of reasoning, John, where it's like, we I need to have humility for ourselves and realize that prophets are not perfect and stuff. And I was like, well, I didn't I don't expect them to be perfect. I shouldn't expect them to be like fist fighting with their brother. I didn't expect them to be doing a whole lot of other scandalous stuff. So it's like they, they that's one of those logical fallacies it just reminds me of that always comes up it's like this straw man that's like you guys ex-mormons you guys want prophets to be perfect and it's like i'm just reading about them and i didn't i didn't know that they could be this effed up and i can't possibly put my faith into a church that is uh, this mismanaged mm. yeah, i agree with them what, what um, do you mean? that we do need more humility but it's not us trying to understand what the fuck they're talking about it's them they need to apologize. They need to say clearly we have misled you. Like 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 if if I get robbed by one guy and then I get robbed by another guy and I get robbed by another guy and the next guy comes along and says I'm not going to rob you. It's not me who needs humility. It's those guys. Like like the the the, the we 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 do. When when I say these guys were just frontier human beings, I don't mean that as an insult. I mean it as a compliment that you can see that they were people trying to construct a view of meaning these people who were raiding indian lands you know and and like trying to create this new zion by a mass genocide like that that must have been weighing on them it had to have been and and um the fact that they were trying to create this narrative that made them special is understandable for us all these years later to say what was going on there, there's nothing wrong with us to ask that question. It is a perfectly humble question to say, I want to know what they actually said. And the fact that people like me or our listeners are vilified for just saying, I, I, I want to know what happened. That, 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 that you're talking about is, is, you know, varsity level gaslighting that they're doing. Right. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. And Kara, I, I agree, you know, on the one hand, I agree with you, John, that 
in some ways, you know, these are these are people who exhibited a lot of courage or integrity or strength or or at least resilience. Um, but on the other hand, like I don't expect my prophets to be perfect, but can they not be sexual predators? Can they not be charlatans? Can they not claim to have powers to translate when they clearly don't, right? To call something revelation, say this will never be changed, and then be like, oh, we're actually going to change it. Uh, yeah, just, or, and follow us. Whatever we say, just forget the old changes and out with the old and with the new. Yeah, and it, or if their former partners, you know, if they make changes and then their former colleagues call them on it, you know, excommunicating them is a really heinous way to marginalize and cut off people that are calling you on your BS. Like nobody, nobody should be above scrutiny. Um, and, and the person that holds themselves above scrutiny and criticism is the first person to to be suspicious of. And that there seems to be a clear repeated pattern of Joseph Smith setting the example of squelching any, you know, squelching any dissent or criticism or anyone that tried to call him on his stuff. And I think that just carried, carried forward through all the church leaders to, to this very day. Mm -hmm. I think, I think. Can't we just not contextualize it? Like, if I want to learn about the Napoleonic Wars, can't I just review the history and not try to constantly decide if Napoleon was wrong? I mean, Napoleon was a terrible person. But can't we just look and say what happened without trying to always say, well, the Waterlooians, they were, they were not really buying into the Napoleonic thing. And none of us really understand what Napoleon was after when he was trying to march into Moscow. Or, you know, like, just what did they do? Let's reserve the, the, all the trying to emotionally make it easy for us to understand until after. Let's, there's nothing wrong with reading history that was published by these guys um, without trying to constantly pigeonhole it in a way that makes you feel good about yourself. And, you know, that's a message to um, Americans in general and white Americans in particular. White people have done terrible things. Black people have done terrible things. Brown people have done terrible things. Human beings are pretty shitty. And we don't have to constantly have a narrative that makes us out to be the good guy. It's okay that our ancestors were terrible people. I guarantee you, dear listener, you are descended from prostitutes and murderers and drug addicts and everything because human beings are human beings, right? And, and rather than try to fit this into some kind of narrative that makes sure that we can sit on billions of dollars in our big red chairs, let's just, is anybody out there just want to engage in Mormon history for Mormon history's sake? That's what I wanted when I started Mormon Expression, but then I found out that of all this pain and terrible stuff, but this stuff is interesting. This stuff is good to know. This stuff is, is a part of, a, of the American experience. It's a part of our engagement with Aboriginal Americans, with the First Nation people. It's part of the settling of the West. It's part of the ideas that shape modern conservatism. It's part of the ideas that, is, is, uh, that shaped the modern um, evangelical movement across the world. Um, the, the, these, 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 are, these, are, these are critical things that we need to understand ourselves. And we need to let go of our self-esteem hanging on people that died 170 years ago. All right. Hell yeah. Preach. Okay. All right, John. So we're at, we're at number 10. Number 10, Times and Seasons. Not um, to be confused with the blog Times and Seasons. Yes. Uh, what was the Times and Seasons? The Times and Seasons um, was uh, the, the newspaper of record um, in Nauvoo. So just a, a quick recap. It was um, Evening and Morning Star was published basically in, in Missouri, in Independence, Missouri. It was replaced by The Messenger and Advocate, which was replaced by The Elder's Journal, which was replaced by The Times and Seasons, um, which there's a foggy part that I don't remember, which became the Improvement Era and then the New Era. So, so the church has always had an official kind of newspaper um, publication arm, and this is that arm from 1839 to 1846 when it ceased um, publication. Um, during the Mormon Wars in 1838, they took the printing press that they used to publish in Far West and they buried it um, so that it wouldn't get um, taken. And they, they went and they dug it up and they hauled it up to Nauvoo, up the river. And um, Ebenezer Robinson and Don Carlos Smith were editors. Now, famously, um, the 
the the printing press was set up down in the basement of the Nauvoo house and there was like a well seepage down there um and um the the big uh problem in Nauvoo was malaria was the ague and um it is generally believed that Don Carlos Smith died or or I think Lucy Mack said this that he he died because he was working in that dank basement um running the the printing press um, so Ebenezer Robinson and Don Carlos were the editors. Um, the printing shop was deeded to Joseph Smith in 1842, so they, they gave it to Joseph Smith in 1842. And then um, John Taylor and Wilfred um, Woodruff ran it, and it was eventually sold to John Taylor. Um, it is a really important um, paper because it is the source of the Wentworth Letters, the King Follett Discourse, the Pearl of Great Price, the Book of Abraham, and the Personal History of Joseph Smith. So... All of those key documents um, um, from this period all come from um, all come from the times and season. Okay, yeah, and that's yeah some of the most important stuff out there, um, including uh, you know a lot of that that Book of Abraham stuff, that late Book of Abraham stuff uh, that that talks about the the translation and what Joseph was doing with it. Doesn't that come from the times and seasons? Just as one example. Yeah, yeah, I believe so. Yeah, and I didn't include. We 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 talked about um, the Nauvoo Expositor um, for this collection. I wanted all that were principally um, faithful sources um, from insiders. Um, the Nauvoo Expositor um, was, of course, eighteen forty four, and I think somebody posted. Where can they see it? it it's online, um, so you can read it in its entirety. But th th those are the ten. Um, if you read those ten sources again. Um, we start with the two, the American Prophet Record, the Diaries of Joseph Smith, and the Essential Joseph Smith, which are a collection of the things that he wrote or dictated himself. Um, the Book of Mormon was, of course, the, the book that he wrote that um, started the whole process. His early revelations were compiled into the Book of Commandments, 1833. Evening and Morning Star was really the publishing arm of the church, um, followed by the Messenger and Advocate. John Whitmer History, as we talked about, was... Um, was um, commissioned by the by the um, Doctrine and Covenants itself. Um, and then we get uh, the Lectures on Faith, which was part of the LDS canon, the Far West, West Record, which shows the, the minutes from the meetings all the way from 1830 to 1844, and, of course, the Time and Seasons, which really was the arm for publishing the new revised Nauvoo period um, doctrine, which is what the... Um, Young based his doctrinal exegesis on John, Young and Taylor that took us to Young's death in 1877, and Taylor died a few short years after that, 1880, I, I believe. I love it. A lot of our viewers and listeners are now sharing some of their favorite original documents. Um, I, I encourage anyone who wants to quickly nominate their favorite. Um, uh, Brian Craig says that Lucy Mack Smith's biography, biography um, or diary is a really valuable resource because she was willing to kind of tell all about uh, what her memories were regarding the early years of the church. And of course, what did Brigham Young do with Lucy Mack's uh, biography and diary, John Larson? <laughs> well, there were two versions, the, 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 her original version, and then he um, republished it. Uh, you could get excommunicated for a while, um, keeping a copy of it. And then they, they rewrote it without her, her permission. Um, I just a uh, note. Um, I, I love this sharing these books. This is great. I I, I left this one out because I wanted the um, source documents. Um, I want to do one in the future where we talk about the most important sort of um, non-source documents that were written by people, and that's definitely one that we will include and and discuss. Totally. I'll share another comment uh, made by one of our uh, viewers. Hugh Berenger writes. I think John Larson's desire to study all this history. Uh, for the sake of history is difficult to do simply because faith-based religion is involved. It's much like trying to dispassionately study biblical history and the life of Jesus. John Larson, what do you thank you, Hugh, for sharing your comment? John Larson, what do you have to say about Hugh's comment? I agree with Hugh. It it it, it is difficult, but it's 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 rewarding. I mean, uh, this stuff will. Reading the source documents will destroy your testimony, and if your testimony is destroyed, it'll piss you off. Um, but you'll laugh a lot, and and hopefully you'll develop a little bit of empathy for these guys. Um, you know, they 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 weren't monsters; they were human beings who did monstrous things from time to time. And um, yeah, and I, I I agree with you. It's 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 interesting and fun to try to engage the Bible and Jesus Christ that way, and say you know what what really happened. 
I I have a kind of a personal philosophy um, about the world today. We live in the era of post-truth. There's just so much information that's flooding things, and much of it is incorrect. And people are like, do your own research and find the things out yourself. And we need to recognize that things are complicated, and we need to stop arriving at conclusions as humanity and say, let's just try to understand what actually is happening. <laughs> let's just try to understand what people, what, what did the founding fathers actually say? Not what we think they said. What did the what did the original Bible say? That's a very Bart Ehrman um, approach to it. What? Well, how did the people at the time process these things? These are really important questions. But like Hugh points out, it's so difficult. That everybody just wants to skip to tell me what I'm supposed to think about this. Tell me what I'm supposed to feel about it. And you know, I've spent years doing that. that you know, pulling this stuff and telling you what to think and feel about it. Hopefully I'm trying to, to show you uh, along the way, but my knowledge of the scripture didn't come because I'm some kind of abstract genius. I just thought this stuff was funny. So I kept reading it. I thought it was interesting. So I kept reading it. And, 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 and that's what allowed me in the long run to start putting the pieces together and church doctrine, um, church teachings, the classes you take at seminary or institute are designed to have you not do that. They're designed to have you not connect the pieces. So when you can start connecting the pieces, I think it's this its this brilliant thing. Not for everybody, but I think there's a lot of people who, who listen to these podcasts endlessly and engage all this thought and, and you know listen to 10, 20, 50 hours a week of this stuff sometimes because they have their headphones in while they're working. I'm saying take a breath and go go actually go actually read it. It's, it's, you'll find it more interesting than you think you will. All right, John Larson, a couple other quick things. Uh, first of all, um, we have one of our uh, viewers, um, Hob Hobgoblin writes, I recommend Dan Vogel's early Mormon document series. Uh, wh what do you have to say about that, John Larson? Do you agree? Do you not agree? Yeah, it's right John's, here. Uh, John's getting to his uh, bookshelf, his sacred bookshelf. That yeah, 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 yeah. But before... Um, before uh... Uh, before the Joseph Smith papers came out, this is one of the best sources. Um, there's there 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 are others. Um, the Joseph Smith, uh, I think it's called the Papers of Joseph Smith, Volume One and Two. Uh, volume One is or Volume Two is hard to get a hold of. So before the Joseph Smith papers, there were several different attempts to to publish this stuff and and put these things out. And if you can get your hands on these copies, the problem is. Mormon, there, uh, for how many Mormons there are, there are very few people um, on either side who actually engage church history. It's rare that any Mormon book has a run of more than 5,000 books. It's very rare for any Mormon book to have a second run. Um, at the height, I've, I've paired my Mormon book collection down to about five or 600 volumes. Um, at the height, I had several thousand. And um, uh, most of them had never been, most Mormon books, the spine has never been broken. <laughs> You would find, you know, somebody had given it to somebody else for Christmas and then it sat on their shelf for a while and then they gave it to DI. And um, it's 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 really a, 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 a travesty because um, there's interesting stuff in here. Um, let me let me ask you, John, do you recommend the Joseph Smith Papers website as a, as a resource for reading early Mormon documents? It's a fantastic resource. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the church is not, um, you know, they're not, um, as far as I know, they've never been caught editing anything. Um, it's, it's, uh, yeah, you, you can, you can see the documents. I think like I, like I said in the beginning, I think sometimes it's overwhelming. Um, it's, it's really hard to read their cursive. Um, I, I struggle reading the, 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 you know, I got taught cursive when I was in school. Um, if you're like a millennial or Gen Z, you probably don't even know how to read cursive. And, but, um, I, I struggle reading those documents. So a lot of it is way overkill. They still are pruning. There are documents that, and, and this might, this is another episode. There are documents that we are pretty sure exist and that are in the vault. That'd be really important. Um, Oliver Cowdery's history, um, there's a whole story about William McClellan papers. And, um, of course that got Hoffman involved. They ended up um, getting um, punked by Hoffman over those. 
And so, so there, there are some documents that the church is clearly hoarding and not letting out. However, um, um, for as best as I can tell, th those are those are the actual faithful reproductions. So, so yeah, it's 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 a good source. Okay. One other thing I was surprised you didn't mention is in the past, I don't know, five years or so, maybe 10, the Council of 50 Minutes finally were released after being kind of held for a long, long time and sort of having been suspected as, you know, containing a lot of important top secrets like information about the Danites, et cetera, Danites. Uh, any reason why you didn't include the Council of 50 Minutes? I just, I, I wanted books that were really accessible. The um and the Council of Fifty Minutes, the Council of Fifty started in Nauvoo, but really extended. So I was really kind of concentrating on the Nauvoo period. Um, church history gets as as the church grows, it gets a lot more complicated, and I wanted to focus on the foundation. And um, one of the best ways to engage the notes of the Council of Fifty is um, D. Michael Quinn had access to those minutes, and that was one of the sources. By the way, the church owes Quinn an apology. Um, because he had access to documents that apologists and other people in farms basically accused him of making sources up, sources that we now have in the Joseph Smith papers. So, um, yeah, yeah, there's the um, the 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 notes on the the temple, um, um, the the temple, um, the Nauvoo um, endowment companies. We have we have we have those. We have the minutes of the Council of Fifty. So there's more interesting stuff that is coming out. Okay, all right. Well, John Larson, thank you again for another fascinating episode. I want to really quickly, anyone who's still with us, please subscribe uh, on YouTube. We really appreciate that. It'll help you keep abreast of episodes that they've come out. It will also help us with the algorithms and help us in our program, reach more people. Also, thanks to everyone who shot us some super chat donations during this episode. Uh, your donations pay for John, they pay for Kara, they pay for Maven. And um, we we really want to be able to keep uh, this, this offering for as long as possible. So uh, thank you for your super chats. Please, everyone, take a moment to subscribe and follow us on YouTube. And Kara's got something she wants I to share. I just want to clarify that uh Are you terrifying or clarifying oh uh, john <laughs> <laughs> that when you donate at the mormon expressions link through uh mormonstories.org slash mormon expression slash yeah. mormon expressions that that does go into a separate fund and That's so right. john larson gets paid out of that fund i get paid out of that fund maven gets paid out of that fund for these episodes so it's specific to when that fund runs out then John Larson episodes have to go away. So it's different than just donating to Mormon stories. So some people don't like John R Larson episodes and they wish they would go away. Well, too bad. People like you are going to keep donating to that fun. Somebody else asked, I, how much does Kara had to drink tonight? None. I'm just sleepy and tired. So I get a little bit silly and impersonating. That's it. That's All right. It. Yeah. So please, thank you, Kara, for that reminder. If you want to see, you know, we, we had uh, at least one or two large donors to the Mormon Expression Project struck drop off recently. That's not super alarming. Just it's oftentimes people get excited about stuff and then they lose interest or move on. That's normal for any, uh, you know, donation, uh, any target. flaky person. Um, it's normal for flaky people. But if you value this content with John Larson and you want to see it continue, please do donate to it. Go to mormonstories.org slash Mormon expression, sign up for a monthly donation. And as long as, uh, you know, we get enough revenue, from that, we'll keep uh, offering this. But John Larson, thanks for uh, not just for your work and for your wisdom and your passion, but just thanks for who you are. And thanks for the 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 bear of a human that's big hearted and uh, brilliant. And for all you have done and continue to do for this community, you know that we see you as a hero and as a legend. And for me, it's one of my great honors of the past five years uh, or more to have you as a special guest on the show. Well, thanks so much. I, I really enjoy, enjoy it. And I think that, um, um, you guys are doing the Lord's work. It's, it's, it's really important. Um, processing out of the church is really, really difficult and, um, any, any, um, help anybody can get, Hey, to answer two questions from the chat, it's water. I seldom <laughs> if ever drink when I'm, when I'm um, doing this. 
And there was a question about the best sources for um, Joseph Smith polygamy. The best sources are all in letters that were written. Um, the church at the time was not acknowledging it publicly, so it didn't appear in any official things. But um, we have like the um, Nancy Rigdon letter and, and, and other things where Joseph Smith mentions it. Um, the best semi-official source, would I would suggest the William Clayton journals. Um, although um, he, he was the personal secretary to Joseph Smith, he writes well, extensively about what Joseph Smith was doing. He was a polygamist himself. Nice. All right. All right. Well, John Larson, thank you so much for everything today. Thanks to all our viewers um, and commenters. Thanks to Maven for coming in last minute and being here in studio. And last but not least, Kara, um, thanks for you and, and being uh, riding shotgun. Thanks um, for all you do on your Nuance Ho channel, both on YouTube and on TikTok, yeah. um, to, to spread a little bit of humor along with the wit and wisdom. Oh, that's nice of you to say. But uh, I just, I'm just like a little, little squirrel getting the roots and nuts and berries from all of the other amazing content creators, podcasters. So shout out to people like Bill Real and RFM and John Larson and John Dolan and people who just like keep this train of moving. So this is such a good community. Hope anyone who is out there who's maybe going through a faith crisis or something and you're trying to figure out sources and stuff. Another great video, John Larson, sorry, John Dolan and I did on my Nuance Ho channel where we brought in my friend Eve who had never heard any of these things. And we just have tell her all about Joseph Smith and she's asking questions and we talk about original sources a lot in that video. It's got like 80, 90,000 views at this point. Really good like starting place for people to go for. So if this would felt a little bit heavy and over your head, don't worry. There's a whole community of people who got you. This is big, overwhelming stuff. But yeah, there's a lot of good resources and a lot of hand-holding. So don't worry about it. All right. And please uh, subscribe to the Nuanceo YouTube channel along with Nima the Mormon, Mormonism Live, uh, Zelf on the Shelf, and uh, any other important creator, subscribe to their channels uh, and uh, like their stuff and share it and donate um, uh, as well. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, thanks for all your support. Thanks for making Mormon Stories what it is. Um, be kind to each other. Be good to each other. Love each other. And we'll see you all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Take care.